Today you're going to learn about distributed loads, and in particular, we'll be able to come up with an equivalent force that represents the effect of the distributed load. So you notice that we've got a pallet here of boards, and those boards obviously are um, providing a load that is distributed along the length of the beam. If we want to size that beam, it would be convenient to have an equivalent load that has the same effect on that beam as the distributed load. Of course, there are, as usual, example problems, group solving problems in the, the uh, slide deck, not that I present, but on the course website. So please go uh, look through those, as well as watching the videos that I present about uh, example problems related to this topic. So this bundle of boards is called a bunk and they're just two by four racks. You might go to your local big box store and see these, uh, you know, for sale. Um, and this is the way they store them, but that's a significant amount of wood and a significant amount of weight that has to be held up in this bunk. And so sizing the structure to support this is definitely something that is important. And when you have a distributed load like this, it's much more convenient to deal with a, a single load. So what's the overall effect of this distributed load? How do we replace it with a single force? How would we do that? So we can do calculations on the beam, size the beam and the fasteners that hold it up and so forth. Another application is where you have, say, a wind load on a flag and you you know, you're just assuming there's a uniform wind pressure on the flag, but the flagpole has to support the flag. How do you determine the effect of the wind? If you ever think about ships from the past, sailing ships with huge masts and, and sails, those masts had to be able to support the load that the wind applied to the sail. And it can be significant, obviously. So this is another application where we have distributed loads and we need to come up with a single equivalent load and where that load is applied in order to size uh, components that are supporting that load. Distributed loads are very, very common. They can be wind loads, they can be weight, they can be, you know, a snow load on a roof is a really common example of a distributed load. But that load has to be supported and we need to know the effect that it has. So the way we'll analyze this is by breaking down this distributed load into infinitesimal sized uh, loads. So taking just a small fraction of the distributed load and pretending that it is a force acting at a particular point. So in the figure below, what you see is that we've got a differential amount of force DF. It's equal to the area under the distributed load curve. And of course, that distributed load is a function of position along the length of the beam. But if we add up all of those infinitesimally small forces, we can come up with a total force. Now, if the if the Distribution is a uniform distribution. It's really easy. If you know that you've got a load of, say, I don't know, 10 pounds per foot and 10 feet, well, it's simple. The total load is 100 pounds, right? Because 10 pounds per foot, 10 feet total, multiply the two together, and you got 100 pounds of force. But if the load varies along the length of the beam or whatever the load is applied to, then you have to actually integrate. And that's what we're going towards here is saying, well, let's, let's break it down where we're pretending we've got a bunch of little bitty forces and we're going to make that limit go to infinity, right? We're going to take the number of forces to infinity where they're zero size loads and, and ask the question, what's the limit? This, this sounds a lot like calculus. That's because it is. And if you haven't used calculus for much, if you're not comfortable with it, don't worry about it. Integration is a pretty simple concept. I'll explain it in a moment. But basically, the distributed load W has units of force per length. But of course, as you can see, it can vary in, in quite a complicated way along the length of, in this case, a beam. So how do we come up with the magnitude of the resultant force? Well, it's pretty easy. If we have a bunch of little bitty forces acting along the length of the beam, then all we really have to do is add them up. Well, how do you add up an infinite number of things? Well, calculus to the rescue. That's what integration is. Integration is simply a sum of an infinite number of things for our purposes. There's probably some mathematical error in there, but for the engineer, that's what it is. That's what it does. And so the resultant force of a distributed load is simply adding up all of these differential forces along the length of the beam. Um, and, you know, since we allow the number of those forces to go to infinity, that's 
but integration does. So we're integrating along the length of the beam, the distributed load. Now, if you take the distributed load function, which describes how the distributed load varies along the length of the beam, and you multiply it by the differential width dx, then what you've done is you've calculated a, calculated a differential force df. And so, as you can see, we're just simply saying that the resultant force is equal to the area under the load distribution curve. That's all it really is. And that's another way of looking at integration is that it just tells you the area under a curve. And so that's what we need. That's how we can come up with the resultant force that is equivalent to an entire uh, distribution. That's basically what we did a moment ago when I gave you the example of, you know, 10 pounds per foot times 10 feet. Well, the only reason we can use multiplication there rather than integration is because the uh, the distributed load is a uniform distributed load. And so if you integrate, you get the exact same result as the multiplication. It's kind of like when you're driving your car and you go, you know, 50 miles per hour for two hours, it's easy to figure out how far you've gone, 100 miles, right? Very simple. Whereas if your speed varies, you know, throughout the entire trip, well, you'd have to actually integrate your speed along the time of travel and that would come up with you know you'd come up with the total distance traveled that way so it's just an equivalent well i guess it's an analogous situation actually but where does this resultant force act because we know that forces can cause moments and we need to know what's the equivalent moment of all these distributed forces well let's go back to considering a, a little bitty piece of force uh, located out at a position x. And of course we can calculate the magnitude of that differential force df as the area under that little segment of the curve by simply multiplying the distributed load w at that point by the width dx of the, the distributed load, the, the segment we're taking into account. Now we've got to take into account an infinite number of these, but don't worry about that. That's what integration does for us. Now the moment of that force about O is the distance X times DF. So we can actually calculate the moment of that little bitty sliver of force. In fact, we can choose any sliver we like along the length of the distributed load and calculate the moment of that infinitesimal force in this manner, just X DF. So if we want the total moment about O caused by this distributed load, all we have to do is add up all of the little bitty moments caused by all the little DFs along the length of the beam. And again, that's what integration does for us. It adds all those things up when DF approaches zero, right? When the differential force approaches zero because the, the, the width of distributed load we take goes smaller and smaller and smaller down to finally an, an infinitesimal or zero amount. So since DF is equal to still the distributed load times DX, we can substitute in the last portion of that equation for DF as W as a function of X DX. Now, don't be confused here. This W parentheses X is not W times X. It's the distributed load W as a function of X. And of course, that function in this particular distributed load would yield a larger value at the beginning, at the origin, at x equals zero, than at the other end, because the distributed load is simply larger at the origin than it is out at uh, the final uh, position at x equal to L. Uh, what that function looks like, I don't know. It doesn't really matter. The point is that the distributed load W depends on what point x you take along the length of the beam. It, you can see that. It, it varies. Okay, But the moment of these individual differential forces, which is w of x times dx, uh, can be integrated. Now, here's the, the interesting part. If we assume that the resultant force acts at some magic distance called x bar, really it's not a magic distance, but at a very special particular point, then the moment of that resultant force will be equivalent to the moment of the distributed load. What am I saying here? Um, there's gotta be some point where we could apply the resultant load that is just the integration of all of this, di this uh, distributed load there's got to be some point where we can apply that load such that that resultant force has the same effect in terms of moment on the beam uh, that the original distributed load had. So that's what we're doing here is we're saying, okay, we can add up the moment of all these differential uh, 
forces along the length of the beam, call that MRO, and then we can choose to set that equal to some special position X bar times the resultant force. This is up to us. We, we can do this because we, we have a degree of freedom here. We can put the resultant force wherever we like, but we want to put it at a point where it causes the same torquing, if you will, about the origin that the original distribution did. So that's what we're doing here in this last equation is we're, we're setting this equation. We're choosing this so that we get an, a special position X bar for the resultant force FR. And since FR can be represented as an integration of the distributed load along the length of the beam, we just have made that substitution. We're developing something here. We've got something on the next slide that is important. So holding all that in your mind, if we compare those two final equations, we could rearrange to solve for this special position by taking the moment of all the uh, individual little bitty forces in the numerator, adding them all up, and dividing by the total of the resultant force. That's what's in the denominator. So it's an integral over an integral. And if you don't like calculus, this probably looks very scary. It's really not that bad because it turns out that that special point X bar is sort of like, it's a balance point, if you will. We'll learn about more about this later, but it's basically what's called the centroid of the distributed load area. Now, this particular shape of distributed load is fairly complicated. I don't know where the centroid is of this shape. I, I, you know, there's, there's, we don't have a description, a mathematical description, of the way that curve moves. Maybe it's some polynomial equation. I, I don't know. It doesn't matter. The point is there's got to be some balance point. There's got to be some point that is the centroid of that area that you see represented by the distributed load and the area under that, that distributed load curve. And that's what this equation will find for us is that so-called centroid. So we'll learn a little bit later about how to find that centroid. But for now, just know that in your book, I think it's in the back, there's a uh, reference section, uh, an appendix section, where some common shaped centroids are uh, located for you, where it says, look, if you've got a triangle, then you know, go either one-third or two-thirds over the length of the base, and you'll be right underneath the centroid. So find that that table in your book. I should have looked up the, the table number, but you can find it easily. It's just properties of areas is what you're looking for. And it's really handy because then most of the time you don't have to do this integration. You can simply look and see what the centroid is, uh, calculate the resultant force, put it at the centroid, and you're done. Uh, in other words, you don't always have to use this equation to find X bar. You just need to know the centroid of the area. So it's, it's not too bad.